you know, expanding at any cost. And so his death set off all of these rumors in London about whether he was concerned about stuff at the bank, whether there was basically some connection between his suicide and Deutsche Bank. And uh, so a few of my colleagues and I started reporting around this. And, you know, one of the unpleasant tasks in a situation like that is that you need to contact the grieving family members. And so we split that up. And my, I got his son, who's uh, named Val Brooksmith. And, uh, you know, just quick Google search turned up that Val was a, uh, a rock musician. He lived in London at the time. He had a, uh, you know, very prominent online social media presence. And so it was no trouble to get in touch with him. And so I struck up uh, initially a digital relationship with Val, but, you know, over several years, it became much more than that. And it used that as a window into what had been going on at the bank. And so Bill Brooksmith's death in a lot of ways becomes, is really Bill Brooksmith's life and then his death um, become in a lot of ways kind of the narrative vehicle that I use to tell the story of the rise and tragic fall of Deutsche Bank. And it really, it's, it really is, a, it's an amazing rise and an amazing story about how this bank kind of reinvents itself and rebuilds itself in the 1990s and the early aughts. And then it meets this, it, it just, you know, goes down in flames in this almost Shakespearean way, I think. And Brooksmith really is at the heart of a lot of that. We, we're going to talk a lot about today the uh, uh, the, the story and your journey with Wal Brooksmith, um, the son. Uh, and because it, it really focuses on one of the most uh, sensitive questions of, of our uh, profession, the, uh, the uh, source journalist relationship that can be very complicated. Um, but I wanted to start just putting the other parallel into the Deutsche Bank story or your book, uh, Donald Trump. Um, and I want to also say to all the participants that uh, you are there, we will have a Q&A at the end of the uh, session where you can write in your questions for David. Uh, but also if you have something during the conversation that you want to uh, bring up, you can just write it in and I'll look at the Q&A um, list and see if I can put it in, the, in as a question. But um, we'll get back to Val. Uh, but first, uh, when did you see that, you know, Deutsche was a very important part of the story of uh, Donald Trump? It's, uh, kind of the same time everyone else did, which was in early 2016, when it became clear that Trump was a serious candidate for initially for the Republican nomination for president and then for to become president. And, you know, the, just the normal political journalism that goes into vetting a candidate like that looks at their finances. And Trump was obviously a very unusual candidate in well, in many ways, but one of them was that he was a businessman and he a big businessman. And so the, it was very uh, kind of an obvious first task for reporters at the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and many other publications to just look into what his reputation as a businessman was. And, you know, not surprisingly, his reputation was quite bad. And in fact, it was so bad that he had been basically excommunicated from the financial system for the most part. And there was one big exception to that, which was Deutsche Bank. And so, you know, it was really interesting for me. I, I was still, I was moving back from London, back to New York with the Wall Street Journal in the summer, or I guess, yeah, late summer of 2016, right as the presidential campaign is entering its uh, final stretch. And here are two, ob well, one object of my obsession, which is Deutsche Bank, which I've been, you know, spending way too much time on for that point, five or six years. And meanwhile, here comes this just juggernaut of a story, Donald Trump's ascent to the presidency. And, it, and Deutsche Bank is a big part of that story. So for me as a journalist, it was just this moment of extraordinary kind of serendipity where this obsession of mine that was pretty nerdy and had been, it was a big story in finance, the collapse of Deutsche Bank, but it was definitely had not crossed over into uh, the general interest realm. My, my parents certainly had not paid any attention to Deutsche Bank. And, and then, but Trump and his deep ties, and I would say, you know, indis the indispensable support the bank had provided, all of a sudden made the Deutsche Bank story much more important and, and much more approachable 
for a general audience. And then you layer on top of that, the fact that Russia was interfering in the 2016 presidential election and trying to get Donald Trump elected. And, at the, and there were all the rumors, you know, swirling around what Donald Trump's involvement with Russia was. And at the same time, Deutsche Bank had a very well-documented history of not only working in Russia, but serving as an illegal conduit for Russian money to get out of Russia and into the Western financial system and including into the uh, Western real estate markets, including in the US and who is a, you know, Donald Trump is a big real estate guy. So there was, uh, it was really from my perspective as someone who had been become a bit of an expert on Deutsche Bank at that time, it was a really, it was just a lucky break for me. And it, um, and it, it just made for a really fascinating story, which I really dug into. But I mean, as as I read your book, it's pretty apparent that Donald Trump wouldn't have become president of the United States without the help of Deutsche Bank. I mean, it, it was like you said, there was all the other banks were turning um, against him. Can you can you elaborate a little bit about, you know, the details of what you found out? Uh, about how Deutsche was helping uh, Trump yeah. during um, the road to the White House. Yeah, and, and it's a real, it's a whole range of services they were providing. And the the biggest and most obvious one is that they were just lending him a ton of money. And over a 18 year period, they lent him upwards of $2 billion. And that's obviously a lot of money, but it's especially a lot of money when you consider that Trump was essentially off limits to other mainstream banks because of his history of defaulting and his company's history of declaring bankruptcy. And so Deutsche Bank, when no other bank would financially support him, at least not consistently, Deutsche Bank repeatedly did so. And it, it allowed him to create or maintain this aura of being a successful businessman when in reality he wasn't. And he, he, was, a, he was a masterful uh, showman and he was someone who was very good at projecting this image of success. But without Deutsche Bank, he wouldn't have been able to build a lot of his marquee properties, including in more, the most recent years, his development of the old post office building in Washington DC into a luxury Trump hotel, which became a real prop on the campaign trail. And since his election has become a kind of a real kind of it's a been a big part of his presidency and the Republican apparatus in Washington. And so, but the services and that Deutsche Bank provided and extend beyond lending. And they were making introductions to him to all sorts of businessmen, including in Russia, uh, with people that were close to the Kremlin and getting them or introducing them so that they could put money into Donald Trump's projects. They were, Deutsche Bank was providing financing to the Kushner family and the Kushner companies as well. And so there was a, and you know, they were also allowing, it allowed Trump as he was getting beaten up on the campaign trail by his rivals and by the media for being this failed businessman who had been, who was so toxic that normal banks wouldn't touch him. It allowed him to come back and say, you know what, if my reputation was so bad, if I'm such a deadbeat, then why on earth is one of the world's largest banks happy to do business with me? And he was right. I mean, Deutsche Bank was happy to do business with him. And that it allowed him to blunt some of the attacks that he was facing in a way that it, it didn't always kind of make it into the public dialogue that much. But I think from the perspective of journalists who were covering him and writing these stories about him, that was a pretty good rebuttal that he had, which was that Deutsche Bank is one of the world's biggest banks. It at that point didn't have a terrible reputation. And it had consistently and was continuing to consistently support him. And so, you know, you can make an, you can have an argument, reasonable people can disagree, I think, about whether or not Trump would have been elected president with or without Deutsche Bank's help. And I think there, I think that's a, it's a really complicated question. And my thinking has kind of evolved on it in the past year or so. Uh, but there's no question that the bank was his primary financial enabler over a very long period of time. And it certainly helped him maintain this aura of invincibility and success at a time when that reputation really was not very well deserved. I think, you know, we could go on forever about these details, which you really uh, uh, write very specifically in the book about, you know, that most fascinating maybe that different departments in Deutsche Bank was turning yeah. against Trump and then the other departments uh, then took him on. And I really recommend all the journalists to, to read your book. But if you're just going to, you know, wrap the Trump part up, um, 
connected to this then argument that he had that you know fake news news journalist saying that i'm not a successful business and why would deutsche bank work with me and uh, i followed you you know on social media last year and and uh, you know some of these attacks from trump have been directed against you and, and your reporting uh, can you um you know give us some insights on how it has been to cover uh, trump and be in the line of fire of his uh, attacks well you know it i don't want to overstate my role in any of this i mean there's there are a lot of journalists including many of my colleagues in the times but also other publications as well that have been under really vicious and personal attack by trump and people in his administration and some of his supporters over there and i think and i've i've had very relatively speaking very little of that and i think there is i think it's really hard for people who are on the brunt of this day in and day out and at first i think it's kind of exciting that the president of the united states the most powerful man in the world is paying attention to you and is you know targeting you and it certainly raises your profile and it, but at the same time i think there are people are crazy right now and it, there are a lot of people both on the left and the right in the united states and probably around the world who are really uh just go completely over the top in the way they interpret um and act on messages like that whether from the president or other people as well and i think there's a again this is not something i personally have experienced but i i think it is actually kind of at times somewhat scary and you can see how in the us it's fox news that is the leading uh perpetrator of this i think where they one of their kind of tv hosts will sick their supporters on journalists who are either have written or are preparing to write negative stories about them and it, people you know show up at their houses and harass them like in person not just digitally and it, so i think and again that's not something i have experienced myself thankfully and it, you know i think there these are it, these are just really toxic times especially in the us um and it, it's gone from being like a toxic digital experience and a toxic online experience to a lot to more and more i think that's bleeding over into the real world and it in some cases again not speaking for myself but like that it can be kind of scary and i think that there what is um really um, strikes when you read the the comments that trump has about your story and other journalists story that have been reporting yeah. on his tax records on deutsche bank and everything is that really maybe this is the most sensitive um part of the whole future of Donald Trump because that is ultimately what can put him in jail i i suppose and uh that's why he doesn't want to show some of these um I, you know uh, i think the bigger thing i think is less my hunch is that it's less about going to jail and although who knows and more about being worried that he is going to either owe a, a lot of money to tax authorities or he is going to be revealed as not having nearly as much money and not being nearly as successful a businessman as he has insisted he is and i think there is in some ways i've actually been surprised by the lack of engagement trump has had uh, online uh, regarding his personal finances and his taxes and his deutsche bank connections and this is trump is someone who has kind of a hair trigger impulse to respond to allegations on twitter and he actually i think has been surprisingly quiet and restrained when it comes to his personal finances and the bank which, which i i think is very telling i don't i do not think at all it's that he doesn't care and doesn't want to engage i think it's that that actually is an area where he has a lot at stake personally and it, he senses that the right thing to do for himself is to not you know fan the flames and fuel the controversy by tweeting about it he he really as that for the most part with some notable exceptions steered clear of that. Um so I mean the the first 200 pages of your book is really about this the story of of you know like you said the rise and fall of Deutsche Bank and how it became you know in Europe it's it's known for maybe being one of the pillars of Nazi Germany but then also after World War II being a very much a force of good um mm -hmm. in many ways in Europe and then the american story that you're writing is really that uh, another very aggressive uh, lending strategy to you know conquer uh, 
um, the U.S. market. Um, but at 200 pages in, right when you wrote about the these, you know, the prof chase for profit and recklessness, and you introduced then your most important character, uh, maybe in the book. You write like this. Um, there was at least one other big problem for Deutsche. It was one that nobody knew about yet, and that even if someone had, would not have been easy to diffuse or even control. That problem had a name. His name was Va Val Brooksman. Uh, so uh, let's talk about Val and in the more general sense, uh, source relationships, which is a unique opportunity for us as a journalist to open up some of these questions because um, as people will soon learn, it's been quite um, a journey for you. And you're right, it's been the most intense source relationship of your career. Uh, how was that? Oh my God, where do you even begin? Um, so first of all, I should say that I've had some other, I'm not, I, I, I have a bit of a specialty in dealing with difficult sources. This is, Val is not the first challenge I've had in this regard, I, my first book, uh, The Spider Network, is about the guy at the center of the LIBOR scandal uh, a few years ago, and who is mildly autistic and was a very like unusual fellow, and just brilliant, but also very uh, a very tough source to deal with. And I spent years with him as well, so I had some experience dealing with complicated sourcing relationships and. But Val uh, took it to a completely new and unprecedented level for me. Um, I mean, to start, Val is, and he's very smart. He's very charismatic and articulate. Um, he is, and he, and he was, and I guess is, grieving. And his father had just died. And Val had, I learned this later, had had a very difficult childhood uh, spending some time in foster care in the United States during his kind of formative years from the ages of five to nine. And that would really scarred him. He had a very kind of difficult upbringing even after he was out of foster care and had led this kind of, I would say, tortured existence where he was a very talented musician, but I think had trouble holding steady jobs. And while he produced a lot of music, he was not having commercial success. And so he was living on the kind of the largesse of his, uh, his family and his father, who was a very successful, uh, very wealthy banker at Deutsche Bank. And so he, when I first got to know him, it was just several days after his father's death and he understandably was a complete wreck. And as anyone would be in that situation. Um, but one of the things that really compounded that was that he has a long history of uh, using hard drugs, whether it's opioids or cocaine or all sorts of other things. And it, he, it was soon after his father's death, he was in and out of rehab. And I didn't even know this at the time. What I knew was I was starting to, you know, get to know Val and we were communicating by phone and text message at this point. What I, I knew is that he was very, he seemed quite erratic. Sometimes when I talked to him on the phone, I couldn't tell if he was sober. I actually, I figured he'd probably been drinking, which turned out not to be the case. Um, but he was, you know, he was someone who, he would come and go, like he would be very effusive and bubbly and uh, just chatty and telling me things in a very charismatic way one day. And then the next week, or the next month, he would just ghost me and refuse to return my phone calls and get very angry with me. And again, this is kind of standard operating procedure with someone who, in my experience, is going through a really tough personal time. And so I was, I think, you know, persistent, but fairly patient with him. And after about six months or so going back and forth, Val kind of got his act together and decided that he was going to start investigating his the circumstances of his father's death and one of the first things he did was he it turns out that his father valid figured out the, the uh passwords to his father's personal email accounts his uh yahoo and gmail accounts and so he went into them and what he found in them just at first glance was that there were a ton of deutsche bank related emails uh in there like hundreds and hundreds probably thousands and thousands in fact and Val had no finance knowledge or expertise, and uh, and he, but he had been talking to me, and he knew that I kind of at least had, you know, a better understanding of this stuff than he did, which is 
you know, I'm a journalist, not a finance expert, but I've been covering this for a long time. And so he asked me to, if I could help him, like figure out what things he should be searching for in his father's email. So my colleagues and I gave him kind of a list of keywords to search for. And Val started sending me stuff from his, that he had re retrieved out of his father's email. And it was uh, remarkable. And there was, you know, you don't often get a glimpse as a journalist inside these institutions that you've spent so long covering from the outside. And so to see just endless one email after another with, you know, just very frank discussions about what was going on inside the bank and both good and bad, it was just this remarkable um, vantage point. And at one point in, I think this is, must have been the summer of 2014, one of the things Val forwarded me was a letter that was in his father's email from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which is one of the main, one of Deutsche Bank's main US regulators. And it was this letter that just excoriated Deutsche Bank for all sorts of financial problems and accounting irregularities and things like that. And Val at that point, I, I'd been receiving this stuff on the condition that I not publish it. And Val at that point, I convinced him to give me permission to publish this letter. And the result, as long as I didn't mention his father or him in the story. And it, uh, the result was a big story in the Wall Street Journal about this that, and that kind of, I think for Val, for me, that was obviously, you know, as any journalist would find that a big like investigative scoop on the front page of the newspaper is exciting. But for Val, I think he realized at that moment when he saw the front page story in the Wall Street Journal, he saw that Deutsche Bank's stock price fell very sharply after the story was published. I think he realized at that point, the power of what he had and it, there was all sorts of secrets hidden inside this bank and he had access to a lot of them in a way that no one else outside the bank had. And it, I think that kind of gave Val a bit more purpose in some ways. And it certainly helped him realize that there was a path to understanding what had happened with his dad through understanding what had happened with Deutsche Bank. And it, so th that was 2014. And my relationship with Val continued for the next five years with many, many, many ups and downs along the way. And I, I think um, we're just going to touch on that. Uh, also uh, the development because the reason why you can actually talk about this is that he he's not your uh, anonymous source anymore but he's right. he's uh, uh, publicly also accused you of stuff and yep. uh, becoming i mean the, the idea for originally was that you and him was gonna have a conversation uh, at grev in Burgos uh, earlier this year but it, it developed and and now it seems like it's it's worse than, than ever your relationship and i think and um, just before getting to that and uh, we have a question here from pat Ogeman, um, which asks about you know um the how the bank treated whistleblowers and if they have tried to you know chasing down leaks chasing down uh, whistleblowers and I think that's interesting in, in, in I mean, in your um, relationship with, with Val during this build up period before you got the documents. Did you have a feeling yeah. that Deutsche tried to close your relationship with him down, trying to stop him from talking to you? Yeah, I mean, I, it's a little confusing to me, even after all these years, to be honest with you. I mean, I think the initial story we did in the journal, there were really no fingerprints attached to Val or to his father. And, um, and there, you know, there are other sources that that could have come from, most of all from the Fed, which obviously had a copy of the letter. And there, so I don't think they had any inkling at that point that Val was doing this. I think actually, I mean, even right at that point in our relationship, which I, I didn't realize this until years later, but because I thought my relationship with him was good, but Val had interpreted something, some of my colleagues actually had written months earlier about his father's death as very negative. And so he, in his mind, he was out to get the Wall Street Journal. And one of the ways he was going to do that, he said later, was that he was going to give us this scoop on this Fed, the Federal Reserve letter to build our confidence in him. And then he was going to plant something false in the journal later that was going to discredit all of us. And at least that's the way he tells the story now. I don't know if that's actually was really going on contemporaneously. But in any case, Val, at that, soon after that, started interacting with reporters from a number of other publications, including Reuters. And 
one of the stories that Reuters did, uh, I think several months later, was a story about more stuff that had been coming out of Bill Brooksman's emails. But in this case, it was much more about Bill Brooksman. It was about Bill Brooksman having warned about, uh, you know, basically accounting problems and regulatory problems in Deutsche Bank's U.S. operations. And at that point, it, from what I've been able to kind of gather after the fact, it seems like Deutsche Bank had a pretty good idea where this stuff was coming from. Because it was, uh, and so, but I don't think the bank actually tried to shut Val down. I think the bank certainly tried to persuade journalists, including me, that Val, A, was not a trustworthy source and B, um, was not authorized to be getting the stuff out of his father's emails. And, um, and you know, at that point, that's just not a strong argument for the bank to be making because it's Val's credibility is irrelevant when he's providing primary source documents the way he was. And obviously, I mean, I don't know about the law outside of the US, but in the US where this activity was happening, the law is very clear that if journalists are entitled to publish things they receive from sources, even if the sources got that information illegally or improperly. So, um, and there's, you know, lots of, Lot, lots of cases going back to the Pentagon Papers in the US that prove that. But I mean, Deutsche Bank does have a long, proud, or maybe not proud, but long kind of notorious history of chasing and silencing and punishing whistleblowers. And Val obviously was not a conventional whistleblower in that he never worked for the company. Um, but it was not a surprise to me at all that the bank would you know, take at least modest steps to try to discourage reporters from interacting with them. And we get a question here, which follows up on my thought as well about, you know, that he now accuses you of, uh, of being a liar and, and uh, mistreating him in, in several ways. And I think, I mean, what, uh, what the story of Val really lear teaches us as journalists, as you know, you know, it's many times with your sources, you are, you become like a therapist, uh, a bodyguard, mm -hmm. sometime a security person, a brother, a parent, maybe. And you get to know all these uh, sensitive facts of a person, which is not really maybe always good for the story, because you know you get to know all the bad sides of a person that can you know uh, bring him in a bad light. And um, and we most of the time we can never talk about this because yep. we are protecting them uh, as much as possible. But you actually decided to you know tell the story of him both the good and bad uh, yep. and look you, the, why did you decide to do that because i thought his story was compelling is the short answer and he agreed to it so i mean there was he for a while was a confidential source and who i had uh granted anonymity and we had agreed on that and at some point val i guess in early i guess it was around the time of the presidential election so around 2016 early 2017 Val decided that he wanted his story told. And because his story is compelling, right? I mean, this is someone with, you know, who has this kind of wild life of drugs and rock and roll. And- it, But he wanted you to tell, he was okay with you writing oh, about, was, you know, his his snorting of oxy, his cocaine, he, he his money was, problems. Val viewed his life, and I think still does view his life as kind of this Hunter S. Thompson style, uh, like, you know, this crazy guy who goes on this crazy tale and do, does a lot of drugs and has sex with a lot of girls and, you know, jams like with great bands and goes in and out of rehab and along the way takes down the world's biggest bank. It, to him, that, that was the story to him. And to me, the story is more complicated, right? It's that, and if we're gonna tell a story about a person and their interactions and their narrative arc, you're gonna do it honestly. And I was very clear with Val along the way about that that I was not going to do kind of a hagiography of, you know, just airbrushing all of the negatives. I was gonna do, if I was gonna do this, I was going to do it honestly. And I was gonna do it, and obviously that's, there's subjectivity involved in how you're uh, portraying human beings. And I was very clear that I was going to do it based on my perception. There's no other way to do it, you know? And, uh, and it, I think, look, I mean, the, the, where the moment at which things got really bad with me and Val was in about a year ago, in October of 2019, when Val, with, with I, with Val's complete agreement and complete transparency, 
I did a profile of him in the New York Times. And this is kind yeah, of- That was the me and my whistleblower piece? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. It, Val, the piece was extensively fact-checked. Like, you know, you don't read the story to the, the subject in advance, but you go over it, not quite line by line, but almost line by line. And, you know, there, which is what happened. And the story ran and Val was, I, mean, I think initially he was okay with it. And then as time passed, he got angrier and angrier about it because it portrayed him in a very complicated light because he's a very complicated person. And, you know, in retrospect, and I've said this publicly before, I've said this to Val privately as well, like in retrospect, there were pieces of that article that were, uh, I wish I had like not been quite so harsh. I think there was like a few, several lines in there in particular that were, came across as quite judgmental and they reflected my honest judgments. But in hindsight, I probably didn't need to reflect those judgments in the pages of the New York Times. And so I've told Val that I wish I had been a little more restrained in that and that I'm sorry about that. And it's true. That said, uh, the story was accurate and I think Fair. I just don't think it was completely necessary to be quite so mean in some places. But to be honest, the 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 story that has been kind of um, transpired since then, so in the past eleven months, I think actually reinforces a lot of what I was saying, which is that Val was started off very well intentioned about this and wanted to get his father's story out there and wanted to understand what had happened with his father's death. But it's morphed into something different at this point. And there is, and he has been, I don't think we need to get into the details here, but he's said a lot of things publicly, whether it's been on social media or in interviews he's done uh, on podcasts and things like that, that have just been lies. I mean, they're like very, very mean spirited lies toward me, but also lies that reflect that are just inaccurate about like what was going on at the bank. And it, there's so look there's oh, what do you do that what what do you do as a journalist when that happens because one thing is writing honestly about him as a person yeah. but then even more complicated is when he turns against you starting to attack you uh, and you, know, you, you want to hear then? a story well i don't know like what do you do i would yeah. welcome your advice i don't know this is uncharted territory for me i mean i'll tell you a story there's uh, which i've not told publicly there's so my book, Dark Tower, is published in February. And about a week before it published, I went out. So Val lives in LA and I live in New York. And so I went out to LA with a producer from the New York Times podcast, The Daily. And we were going to record an episode with him where we kind of went through his story. And we were also going to allow him to air his grievances about me because he was very angry. And I brought him a couple copies of the book that had not yet been released. And so we get out there and we arrive, the producer and I arrive at his house and uh, we knock on the door and we, we go inside and in there waiting for us is a documentary TV crew that he had set up and had been working with to film our interview. And, you know, we face a choice. Do we go ahead with this or do we just turn around and go home? And we decide to go ahead with it and figuring, you know, that we have nothing to hide here. There is, I had already told him that I had some regrets about how the October 2019 story came out. And you know, like we make mistakes and I think it's right for me as a journalist and for everyone as journalists to be transparent about mistakes we make and own them. And so I, I have nothing to hide at all. And so we sit down for this interview and it would just turned into this like bloodbath basically where he was with the cameras rolling, was attacking me and accusing me of stuff. It was just, it was, just nonsense, like making stuff up about me, making stuff up about things I told him, making stuff up about things that other sources of mine he claimed had told Val. It was just, just bonkers stuff. And so, you know, like, what are you going to do? I told him that's just not true. And I move on. So I'm getting on the plane to go back to- Did you get New angry? York. Did you, were you I was ups- to cool I or? I mean, I wasn't, I, I was extremely angry inside. I mean, I think what- I haven't seen the video uh, because it hasn't aired. Um, I, I don't know if I kept my cool. I like, certainly inside of me, I wasn't keeping my cool. I was very upset. I was, and afterwards, I, and I was talking to the producer for The Daily who was with me, who was witness to this whole thing. And I was like, man, I like, don't know whether to like scream or cry or like punch someone. Like I really, I, it was very upsetting for me. And it, uh, but on the other hand, there's,
you know, you can't get into this public fight with your source. And so I basically kept my mouth shut. And over the next several days, Val had clearly like laid out this plan to try to discredit and destroy me. And literally I'm getting on the plane to go back to New York and I get like a Twitter notification that someone had tagged me on Twitter. And it's this hacking website that had somehow gotten an early draft of my book. And Val the previous day had said that, I thought he was lying, but he had said that he had like hacked somehow or his hacker friend had gotten a copy of my book and they actually had, and I don't know how. It was like an early draft and it appeared online and it's like Val is promoting it. And point B, I'm not even trying to like, I don't even know why I'm saying this. It was a very upsetting period for me. And I think the only way that I could figure out how to handle that was to just like, keep in mind that I work for the New York Times. I have a big news organization and a voice and an outlet. And there's not, if not, I, I, I just need to kind of keep my head down and try not to engage with this. And, uh, and so that's what I did. And I don't know if that was the right thing to do. Honestly, I'd never been in a situation like this. And, uh, and it's, I mean, this kind of stuff has continued as I've done book promotion stuff and book talks like Val and his buddies have like crashed a bunch of zoom calls like this one before, frankly. And so it's been a, it's been a pretty turbulent year or so, to be honest with you. Um, so I, I, I'm sure that the, the viewers have more questions on, on this Val story and, and we'll uh, bring in some questions pretty soon, but I just wanted to, and uh, before we do that, um, hey, can I just actually say one other thing though about Val? Yeah. Like, I think, so the, the story that ran the New York times, I think was it honestly, there were a few lines in there that were quite negative about Val, but I think the overall gist of the piece portrayed him as providing, having provided a public service by disclosing documents. And I know that the book, and he is the, he, he and his father are the two primary protagonists of the book. They come yeah. across both of them as complicated and flawed human beings because we are all complicated and flawed human beings. But overall, they, I, I think they come across in a very positive way. And I think that's because overall, the role that Val has played is very positive. He has brought all sorts of stuff to light that, not, that would not otherwise have come to light. And that is fundamentally the most important thing that any whistleblower or citizen can do. And I think that's a very, very uh, important lesson for all journalists is that, you know, when you get the chance of portraying a source or whistleblower and not only saying, you know, I met this guy in a, in a secret place, I can't tell anything about him or her. It's to really uh, make it uh, you know, all whistleblowers have different agendas, different drives, forces, uh, and to really not always portray them as heroes with only, you know, uh, trying to make the world better uh, is a very important thing for making uh, journalism more uh, nuanced. Um, but I want to I want to touch on on one of the most impressive uh, things about the book is really how you acquired all these sources in inside of the bank community and, and inside of Deutsche Bank. And uh, you write that you talked to, to about 200 uh, journalists, former and current uh, Deutsche Bank. Not journalists. Uh, oh, sorry. Bank, bank, yeah. bank employees, yeah. Bankers. Yeah. And um, so I, I wanted to have your like, uh, how do you do a crash course here for the Swedish journalist? Uh, so I'm going to play a, a Deutsche Banker sitting in, in New York. Uh, and I'm pretty concerned with all ties with the, I found out an internal report of, of you know, um, how the dealings of Trump have been going on in the bank. And I've been talking about this as a, at a party and at that place, there was a guy you know. So you get the tips that, you know, this banker is probably keen on talking to somebody because he's upset, uh, but you don't know him. Uh, you only have his phone number. Uh, what do you do? I mean, I think you initially call up introduce yourself and say that you are a journalist working on a book or a story about the bank and that you had heard from someone that he would be someone good to talk to. And the guy- I, I, ne I never talk to journalists. I can't, I can't right. do this conversation anymore. Well, let's just have an off the record talk. I'm not going to quote you, use your name. And I just want to hear what you've got because you, what you've got according to the person I heard this from is I, I think really needs to see the light of day and I can, we can do this in a way, I guarantee you that it is not, you, there will not be any fingerprints to you. 
I've done this a million times with other people and it, this can be done in a, ver a way that is very safe and secure for you. But I, I think even this phone can be, be uh, I mean, Deutsche phone. owns this phone. How, how should we why do don't, this? Why don't we meet in person? Or, you know, there's, it's, uh, I think I probably wouldn't just be calling the person uh, on a normal phone to begin with, to be honest with you. I would be either, I would be trying to figure out, I would have done a lot of research on this person beforehand, honestly, to figure out who they are, what their background is, uh, you know, common interests. Um, and, and really the bottom line is trying to figure out Look, the bottom line with any source is that they are not going to talk to you as a journalist unless they perceive it as being in their self-interest to do so. And so the trick to kind of unlock most sources in my experience is to figure out how to make them perceive it as in their self-interest to share something with you. And, and people perceive, can have that perception for you know a million different reasons. Maybe it's that they want to change the world for the better, or maybe it's that they are pissed off at their boss or their colleagues and want to kind of get revenge. Or maybe it's that they love the thrill of talking to someone who is going to put something in the public domain or maybe you know it's, it could be a million different permutations uh of that and, and and you can often in my experience figure out a lot about what makes a person tick just by doing kind of some kind of vigorous scrubbing of what's available of them online or in this case talking to their friend who talked to them at the party and uh and so you just need, in this case, the person is probably wants something out there, but is obviously wants to make sure that, you know, they don't want to risk their job or, and their livelihood and their reputation to do so. And so you need to figure out a way to communicate with them that will really um, project not only sympathy, uh, but also just real confidence and trust. So. In this case, it's probably that I have a lot of experience doing this. I've done this a million times with other people in a way that has gotten the information out there and has not once burned the actual source of the information. And the first thing we need to do is just meet in person so you can look me in the eye and see that I am a real person and I understand this and that you can trust me because it's impossible to do that over the phone. You can't, you're not gonna build trust that way. And so, um, so then I, I answered you in my very German uh, accent saying, okay, to meet. Where do we meet? Well, these days, I don't know. Uh, uh, back in the good old days, uh, when people were allowed to venture outside of their houses and gather in coffee shops, I would probably would have picked, and there are a number of just shitty places, sorry, uh, not very nice places in <laughs> all over uh, Manhattan that no self-respecting bank employee would ever set foot in. And those are the great types of places to go to. But again, even that, it comes down to a little bit of a personality profile of the, the potential source. And if this is someone who is low, like a low level person within the bank, like they actually, maybe you wanna take them somewhere nice and kind of wine them and dine them a little bit. If it's someone who's at a, a higher level capacity, that's going to be worried about being spotted with you. You definitely want to go for whether, and you also want to see if there, if this is someone, and you can often determine that's just looking at social media. Do they like to drink? Do they like? Do they seem to travel all over the world and have like you know interesting, sophisticated uh, taste in food? Maybe you want to go to Chinatown or Koreatown, and in New York, and go somewhere that is like you know, interesting to eat, but it's not, you're not going to be spotted. And so there's, uh, in these types of situations, I tend to do a lot of homework before even making that first approach. And oftentimes my colleagues and I, and right now my job, I'm a reporter, but I'm also an editor. So I manage a small group um, of investigative reporters as well. And we often, uh, when before approaching complicated sources like this, um, we will basically do role playing exercises where we like this. do what you were a little bit like <laughs> this, yeah, a little bit like this. Although I, I've got to say, I've never actually done it over Zoom or Google Hangouts. We've it's really it's one of the reasons uh, the pandemic is so difficult for me as a journalist is that I'm much it's much easier for me to do this stuff when I'm sitting face to face with someone. And lastly, then uh, question that. Uh, it cures me is that like when you wine and dine with some uh, 
some banker is new york times paying for that or is it your own pocket yeah, yeah new york times pays for it i mean well it, it actually depends if it's so one of the things that worked really well for me in writing this book is that i was a lot of what i was doing i was doing kind of along the way in new york times stories and so that uh in that case, the New York Times would pay for it. If it, there were some things I was doing just for the book, including going out to LA on a couple of occasions to meet with Val, which I paid for out of my own pocket. Um, but in general, as long as it's for New York Times reporting, it's the Times will pay for it. Um, and it, that's also just like, a, in, in my experience, at least it was really helpful to be writing for the New York Times as I was doing this book project, because it allowed me to publish stories along the way and the act of publishing the stories, it, my publisher was actually kind of concerned that I was cannibalizing some of the juiciest stuff that was in the book about Trump. And I was also concerned about that a little bit, but it actually worked out extremely well because the act of publishing these stories got a lot more sources to come forward, so. Great, thank you so much. Uh, let's see if uh, what people are wondering here. Uh, uh, one very, uh, interesting question is of course is, is here how does fact checking work when you write a piece for the new york times like uh, how do, how does the, um, yeah what's it the depends process? it depends on the part of the new york times you're writing it for which is really surprising to me actually and for the most part in the news pages of the new york times there is no fact checking i mean the fact checking is that's not true the fact checking is entirely on the reporter and maybe to a lesser extent on the reporter's direct editor and so we go through story the reporter will go through a story line by line fact by fact and even the most basic stuff like you know just obviously making sure you've got names spelled correctly and people's ages right um but also often in fact i think generally you would go with if you are quoting a source or saying anything about uh, someone in the, as a subject of the story, you're going to go to them either over the phone or in writing with kind of a like a bullet pointed list of things, of facts and assertions you're making um, and give them, make sure that they know what's coming because it's much better to have the angry conversation before the story publishes rather than after. And, you know, there's uh, obviously if, someone objects to something or disagrees with something that does not mean you're necessarily going to change it or take it out but it does mean that you listen with uh with an open mind to what they're saying and tell you know oftentimes that means you're telling them well i get that you're saying that and that's fine but that doesn't change the fact that you know we have six sources saying something different or we have a document that says differently uh and so that's we're happy if you want to be on the record saying something is not true we're happy to print that, but it, just so you know, that's going to be juxtaposed with us saying six sources say the opposite is true. And so that in the main news pages, that's essentially what the fact checking is. Um, when you're writing for the, the New York Times also has a magazine, which I've written for, and it, the fact checking there is actually, it's interesting. There's like a staff of professional fact checkers who go and re-interview your sources and check everything with them. and. That's obviously, I mean, that, that's just a, it's a more effective way of getting facts, right? It's also much more time consuming and uh, expensive. Um, and I've actually only done that once with the times and it was just terrifying and exhausting and also saved me from making a lot of mistakes. Uh, so here's a question from Marina uh, about your, uh, the role of your book in the, in the um, upcoming election and I think, the question can be asked in more broader sense as well. Like, will the Deutsche story be a part of the the presidential election now, or does it still matter? Does anything matter? Um, uh, uh, I have no idea. There, you know, the presidential election and what is kind of important in it changes from week to week and day to day and hour to hour. And what we all thought at 5 p.m. last night would matter, changed an hour later when Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the Supreme Court passed away. And uh, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, certainly I think that the, all the questions surrounding Donald Trump's finances, it would take quite a bombshell at this point for that to actually change any people's opinions in a real way. And I think most people have, 
America, like many other countries right now, is extremely polarized. And I think most people on the left despise Donald Trump and nothing is going to make them like him. And most people on the right love Donald Trump and nothing is going to really fundamentally shake that opinion. And certainly not anything about, um, well, I shouldn't say that. I, I would be very surprised if anything about his finances, any secrets that were to emerge would fundamentally change the positions on either the right or the left. But you know, I should also say that I almost always am wrong when I make predictions like that. So uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think there, obviously there remain an enormous number of very important unanswered questions about Trump's finances, including just basic things like who are his business partners? Who is he making money with? Does he pay taxes? Things like that. And in a normal uh, presidential election with normal candidates and normal times, you would think those would be kind of existential make or break questions. But one thing I think we've all learned in the past five years is that these are not normal times. Um, so uh, Lars has a question about uh, what's the bank interest in this of banking Trump? What have they got in return? Uh, do, they do they make more money with Trump as a president than Hillary Clinton? He asks. Um, huh. Well, I mean, initially the bank's interest in lending to Trump was that they were trying to, the bank was trying to make a name for itself in the United States. And it was trying to get clients and it was trying to establish a brand. And it, um, it was very hard for them to find clients, good clients to bank with because they were this upstart bank. Very few people in America had heard of them or could pronounce it, their name. And so it, you're not going to get a, uh, grade A uh, client when the, that grade A client is going to be banked by the likes of JP Morgan or Citibank or Goldman Sachs. And so Deutsche Bank had to kind of go looking for people who had a lot of baggage and were flawed and Trump having defaulted on loans and declared bankruptcy fit that bill perfectly. And so initially, I, mean, I think Deutsche Bank was kind of eager for whatever scraps it could pick up. The reality is that despite Trump's terrible track record at paying back lenders or you know business partners for the most part with a couple of very notable important exceptions trump actually did repay the loans that he got from deutsche bank and so i think over the years the deutsche bank or the trump relationship has actually been quite profitable for deutsche bank just from a pure uh dollars and cents perspective and i think if you look at it through a uh, slightly broader lens it's been when and you look at reputational damage the bank has suffered because of this is actually it's quite negative, but just purely in financial terms, I think for the most part, it's been positive. And in terms of whether it's been better or worse for the bank with Hillary, with Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, I think unquestionably it's been better with Trump. And but that I don't think that's necessarily because Trump particularly favors Deutsche Bank. I think it's that Trump and his administration have been very favorable toward many major industries, including the finance industry, in terms of relaxing regulations and loosening oversight. Great. Um, so we've been talking for an hour. And uh, when it comes to future stories, I know that you are curious on tomorrow's reporting from uh, uh, the ICIJ. Uh, yeah, tell us what you got, Axel. <laughs> so SVT is a part of that project, and, and we're launching it tomorrow uh, worldwide deadline at i think it's uh so it's 1 p.m new york time uh, 7 you're gonna ruin my sunday afternoon thank you so 7 p much. 7 p.m swedish time and maybe there will be some deutsche in there uh we'll you're see you're just torturing me deliberately and it's not fair but thank you so much for talking to us and welcome uh, to sweden anytime when we open up the borders I can't wait. Thanks for having me. Thank you.